Hello, my peeps, and welcome back to Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves. I am your host, Ike. And before I get too excited, happy, carried away, I'd like to just take a moment and say thanks for being here and giving this spot a listen. It means a lot to me that you choose to use your precious time and give me and my guest your ears. Now, if after all this, you still have the wherewithal, it'd be really cool if you share this with someone who you think would like it, or just subscribe yourself if you already haven't. That'd mean a lot. And if you want to tell me what parts of the show you were passionate about, peeved you off, or just say hi, you can always reach me on Twitter at Like Ikes and via email by Passion and Peeves Podcast at gmail.com. So, uh, if you're getting this hot off the presses, you'll notice that it's quite earlier than the normal release date. That's because I'm going to yet another tournament. I uh, will be going to play the 75k standard event it's got a more hoity-toity name than that but that's all i know it as uh in chicago illinois um this is gonna be my last kind of big tournament for a while until like the end of april which my sleep schedule my wallet and my bosses are very thankful to hear uh something i'm very thankful to have over with Speaking of hot off the presses, I just got my crown put in. That was, it's, uh, it's making it interesting to talk. As well as found out, I've been having this thing for a while and didn't really discuss it on here because it's none of your business. Also, I didn't want to worry y'all is I have like three of my teeth in the front are just occasionally for no reason at all, just hurties. And I talked to my dentist about today and they ran a couple of x-rays and they're like, yeah, we have no idea. It's, they, nothing's coming up. You're fine, but we know you're in pain. So, uh, I don't know. Like, yeah, all right. So that's fun. It wasn't bad. I mean, it's not going to cost me money. It still hurts. It's a very peculiar situation. Uh, so I don't mean to be rushing, but I'm going to be rushing through this because I'm trying to get this to my editor to get this uploaded. Sorry, Richard. Love you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Um, <laughs> try to slow myself down. It's a skosh. <sighs> okay. So I don't want to sound like an old man or anything and definitely not saying that I am, although my facial hair makes me think that I might be, uh, but I'm really starting to distrust today's youth. <laughs> the amount of times at my workplace that kids will just say things and they get the reaction they want and then immediately be hypocritical in the nature of what they had said is just wild. And I don't know if it's because I'm working with the kind of on the fringe population or what, what have you, but it definitely is like, I mean, I felt like we were okay back in my day at getting what we wanted from our parents and whatnot. But this is some like next level shit. I don't know if it's these these kids are burgeoning great actors, if the internet's helping a lot, if our keywords are triggering to me more than others, but uh, I'm definitely a, a lot warier than I, I would have been in the past. Uh, you know, like a year and a half ago, I would have been a lot more trusting of kids, and now I'm just like, not a fucking chance. None of you. All you are lying sons of bitches. Um, <laughs> people that don't lie or at least shouldn't lie, are your friends. Got a really good piece of advice that applied to magic, and I think applies to life. My friend Dan, via He Believes John Finkel, the arguably the greatest magic player of all time, had this great quote that I'll, I, I hope you'll entertain. Good players do the right thing ten times in a row, lose, and then do it another ten times. I find a lot of solace in this quote and inspiration that just because what we do doesn't yield positive results, if the theory is sound, we double check the math and it holds up to not be disheartened by the the yield of our actions, but to kind of double down and stick to our guns. Because where life may not give us what we want, if we are doing the right or the best thing that we can find and not to say that we shouldn't take you know inventory and kind of go back to the drawing board constantly but if this is the best we've got 
to not be sad that the result wasn't what we wanted, but to be proud that we did our best. Speaking of doing our best, I fit all my shit into one backpack this go-round. Huzzah! Also, not because I wanted to, but because American Airlines is a cheap son bitch and uh, charges you for having a personal or like an overhead bag. If you put anything in the overhead, 30 bucks. Get wrecked, nerds. It's so delightful. So uh, thanks, American Airlines, you fucking asshole. Anywho, people that aren't fucking assholes, our guest today, a lovely gentleman by the name of Kyle Rowan came on and we had a lovely chat. So without further ado and complaining by me, Kyle Rowan, everybody. All right, folks, this evening you're in for a treat. We have a man who can make pastiche de nata from scratch. He binged all the Twilight films just so he could not be a hypocrite in judging them and has fought on behalf of the Lorax in replanting blue oak trees while getting school credit. It's the perfectly pastelicious Kyle Rowan! Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for coming on. Now, before you love any more things, we got to know what is the biggest thing you love, my friend. What is your passion de resistance? I just love drawing. I love, you know, drawing and art in general. Um, I've done it since I was in elementary school, really young. And I don't know, it's just been always something I've been drawn to over the years. It's the thing I've stuck with the most. And it just, you know, it just calms me. It soothes me. And I've just recently rediscovered getting back into it. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say you started as a kid, how old were you when you first were doing more than, you know, drawing penises in a notebook a la Jonah Hill style? <laughs> oh, gosh. I'm sure my, my, my mom can actually answer this question because I don't remember. But uh, I, I, I've been drawing since, gosh... Uh, it would have been, yeah, I mean, it would have been like third, second grade, um, probably earlier I've been drawing, but like, yeah, like I remember when I was younger in elementary school, I, I would draw like comic books. I, I got really into the Matrix when I was too young and I <laughs> and I really started uh, and, I, and a lot of my earlier comics were based off of that. Or just like war movies I had seen, and so all these like action, <laughs> all and they were all stick figures too. So you go back to like, you know, really young, and you're just drawing stick figures, like yeah, beating each other up with like katanas and rocket launchers. <laughs> like really, there's silly. literally video games that I have bought, played for hundreds of hours that have that as their theme. So oh you, man, you weren't doing too bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what really early, really early on. Other than the Matrix, what were some early inspirations? Were you like a big fan of comic books, of cartoons? Cartoons mostly, comic books later. Um, comic books I don't think I got in but really into um, until maybe high school. That's when I that's when I first read Watchmen and like Sandman and all the really good Damn. sort of intro intro graphic novels. When you're those getting were your into first it. like graphic novels? Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember Jeez. like. I remember I I was in a in a shop and I saw the Watchmen like something about the yellow yeah. just drew me and I was like what's this and it's like superheroes and I'm like and then you read it and it's not about superheroes at all no. but it's uh, <laughs> the but downfall was, of society <laughs> yeah exactly about other things but um yeah that's so, so crazy I, you like that's... cut the line on all these things people like eventually <laughs> find the Matrix you start with the Matrix. People eventually find Watchmen and Sam, and you just start with Sam. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say I found the Matrix. I would say like I was in daycare, and for whatever reason, the um, the people <laughs> thought it'd be okay to show a bunch of really young kids the Matrix, and so it scarred me. That whole bit where ne Mark, uh, Neo wakes up in the in the uh, yeah. future like scarred my nightmares for years. After, yeah, <laughs> after it's, it's horrifyingly <laughs> awesome. Goodness but uh, but yeah, so yeah, uh, so comics much later. So what were some of the cartoons that you remember watching? Oh man. I mean, I was a I was a I was born in 90 and so really like 2000s was my 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 era and so it's all, you know, classic Nickelodeon stuff like 
Hey Arnold, um, Cat Dog. Angry, you know, Cartoon, Net- Cartoon Network stuff like Angry Beavers, or even like you go back to like old stuff, like the the old Flesher cartoons, or the. Did you ever watch like Rocky and Bullwinkle? And, yeah. <laughs> uh, w- Wacky Races is another one that I really loved as a kid. Um, so stuff like that really, I just absorbed all of those when I was young, and would draw like characters of that style. That's so cool. Yeah. So you're doing that, then you go watch these awesome, mind-blowing movies, read these awesome, mind-blowing comics at too young of age or just right at the right time for you. When did you first, were you like big into art class growing up? Or was like, you know, was that your favorite period? Yeah, art, art class was absolutely that. And I, I really liked French, but predominantly art class. Yeah, <laughs> like I really, well, it was like, Oh, so I was you never, do all on guard art, is what you're saying. I do, uh, yeah, exactly. You know, it's, you can't really tell what it is. Is this a is this a toilet? We don't know. You know that kind of art. Uh, Everything's <laughs> a toilet if you use it as every, such. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's all really art to begin with. But um, no, I, I loved I loved my art classes because I mean I had a bad habit of like draw as you said like Jonah Hill drawing penises. I would just draw and doodle on like my tests or my books. And <laughs> and in middle school, like I, I remember getting in trouble so many times, and I actually worked out a system with my teacher, uh, Mister. <laughs> I'll give a shout out to Mister Denny. I love him so much. He's the best. Yeah. But um, yeah, like we worked out a system. Whenever he would catch me drawing, he would like make a sign that that I should get back to work. But um yeah so i always loved drawing and uh yeah i went to an art art middle school where they really you know they really push you doing art in a lot of different aspects and so yeah when i got to high school i was always about like what's the next art class what what am i doing there and you know i I did okay art middle school yeah i did it was called river school and it was geared towards art centric arts like it's an art centric school they do offer like it is like a normal middle school where there are like history and English courses and stuff like that, but it is geared more towards the arts. So you actually have to do like an art test to get in. Like you have to make this like you have to write, you have to write an essay and you got to do a piece that's like a portrait about yourself. And it's and I made this like collage of found materials of my face that looked weird, you know, but it, it got it got me in. So that was cool. That's but, awesome. Um, so how you went from that to just back to a normal high school though? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, wow, yeah. what a fucking L. You it go was, to this awesome yeah. like utopia and then it's like, all right, back to Muggle Land. You're like, fuck like it's like yeah. Harry Potter if you got kicked out of Hogwarts after the third year. It's like, That's oh, kinda like, how it, yeah. shit. <laughs> like And it was like significantly <laughs> bigger. Yeah. And it was significantly bigger. It was like five times the size. And so I was just like <laughs> little little sad middle school year old me was just so scared. But you know, it was it was okay. It was fine. I I, I learned to cope. But yeah, I always look forward to their classes and I really grew attached to my art teacher. You know, I would help do pro- art projects around school. I did a mural that should hopefully is still there. Who knows? <laughs> um, for the school. Um, but yeah, yeah it hopefully it wasn't fun. like that time you asked your parents to put something on the fridge. The second you turned away, they're like, just throw it away and say we lost it. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of notorious in my art class because uh, I remember Miss Golok was so sweet, but she always like, like I would always bring music. And uh-huh. like, I, cause I was, I always listen to music again, this goes back to the middle thing. Like I always listened to my CDs in class um, and especially in art school. And, and it got to the point where I was having my, my headphones open. So everyone at the table I was at could hear. And then it became Kyle, just put your CDs on to the, the <laughs> stereo. And so we'd be blasting like dragon force. <laughs> Awesome. And then, how did you not brought... end up as a dj with that kind uh, of like fulfillment there like knows? oh like you know go, that's like man that's got to be so affirming going from oh, i'm just listening fun. to my music all right what are you listening to all right the mm-hmm. whole class wants to know what kyle's listening to yeah that's it was so awesome i don't know how i look back on it and i'm like i don't know how i swung that like the teacher must have <laughs> just really dug my artwork so much where she's just like listen to what this guy's listening to so you, i don't know but it was fun. So after high school, what did you do for further education? Uh, community college. So I just went to the Napa Community College and, again, took took some more art courses, but was trying to gear towards a major that I could potentially apply in the real world. Because as much as I love doing artwork, um, and the unfortunate reality is, is fine artists aren't really paid a lot. Like, it's really rare to get into, like, gallery settings, and you have to work really hard at it and even then you might not be profitable and so at that Mm -hmm. point i was really trying to gear towards what could be a feasible job i would like to do as a career 
And so I started just doing general ed, and then I started doing art history and and versatile art courses. And I was just trying to get my bachelor of arts, or what is mm-hmm. it? No, it's it's not it's 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 not bachelor yet. It's, it's that's community college, but it was associate. I was yeah. trying to get my associate degree, and um, and I decided to push for the arts because that's what I wanted to do. And um, and so I knew I wanted to get in the arts, but I didn't quite know yet what I wanted to do. So when I was doing community college, I was kind of looking into university options and what I could apply to there. And um, it didn't take long, but I event- I pretty much almost outright chose Academy of Art University in San Francisco just because of when it was close by. It was in San Francisco, yeah. Napa. You know, my parents could visit, but also <laughs> they had. Yeah, I mean, that was more that was importantly, kind of the... you could go home and do your laundry. Let's, well, let's get it. I don't know if it's worth that long of a drive, but yes, <laughs> you, you're not wrong. I think it was more for them because they really weren't ready for me to go yeah. far away yet. And to be honest, I probably wasn't either. But, but yeah, so I, that's pretty much what I what I did. It was just general arts, typical, you know, um, associate degree, trying to get sort of a a foothold mostly i did it for the degree so i could apply to university Mm. okay so rewinding a little bit the way you were talking about it it sounded like you kind of hadn't given up on the idea but you're like all right well art isn't really a jobby job i need to be a little bit more kind of um you know workplace minded and like like kind of expanding my logic but you still couldn't give up art was there any point you thought of doing a different kind of major and being like i'll do business but i'll you know i'll draw for it was it or was it just like it's got to be art plus something you know i i think it's funny i think my my parents kind of really wanted me to push to try and apply my art somewhere because they knew they just knew i loved doing it and they they wanted me to and they really just wanted me to try and find a way for me to apply it in the real world because i remember like i i was I still am, but like, I was so attached to my parents at that point too, where I was just like, I even told my dad, cause he was a banker at that time. And uh, I was like, dad, I'll come work with you at a bank. And he's like, Kyle, <laughs> if you work at a bank, I will kill you. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not doing that. Oh, <laughs> so, that's, that's so beautiful. That's <laughs> like, I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> I'll fucking kill you. And say the, yeah. But so I was, he quickly, he, he, he immediately wanted to motivate me to not yeah. do that. To, to, he, he, saw, he looked at his own life and went, yeah. not for my boy. <laughs> not, not for, not save for him my, from the yeah. salt mines. Just yeah. <laughs> get him out here. Yeah. Well, did, and again, he knew, he knew that I really loved yeah. the art. So did he, uh, I small nitpick. I'm curious about, did yeah. he like his job or was that a job he did for the money? Oh, that's a good question. I mean. I think he would tell you that he did it for the money. I remember him telling me all the time when we were like, ah, you know, I just, you know, I know how to do it. And I'm just, I've been doing it for so long now. I know that when earlier in his life, he tried doing other things, then they just didn't pan out. But Mm. um, I think, I think it was initially a job that he had to do for the money. I think over time there, I think I I would like to think over time, he, there was aspects of the job that he did enjoy. I think, I think he enjoyed the people he worked with. I think there were some people he really liked. It, it wasn't it wasn't a man saving his son from the coal mines, but it was a man no, saving, no. making sure that his son accomplished his dreams. I, I think he just wanted to make sure that I would, yeah, that I, yeah. I wanted to at, somehow do what I loved as that's, my job. That's fucking, I love yeah. how it's like every, I mean, slight spoiler just... alert, you work in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It, but it's kind of lovely because so many movies are done the opposite. The mm-hmm. son's like, I want to live my dream. And the dad's like, fuck you, work in the factory. <laughs> and <laughs> your, your dad, like, if the roles reverse, you're like, I'm going to work in the factory next to you, Papa. He's like, please, God, no. <laughs> like, yeah. I love you, but you should not do that. That is not where you belong. I've got the black got lung. In your ear. <laughs> <laughs> Papa. <laughs> All right. So from there, we what? Uh, so you go to San Francisco University of Art. Uh, or the, the Academy of Art, Academy, Academy of Art University, Art. University yeah, yeah. AAU for short. Yeah, you go to AAU. How does how does going from yeah you, know, you have this interesting journey of art middle school, normal high school, taking art classes at a community college, which is not particularly art driven, but it does have you know enough to where you can get an associate's degree, to then going to an art university. Mm-hmm. How how was that transition from that one? Oh, I mean, it's overwhelming because it's like one, you come from Napa, which is 
no matter what people say, it's well known. It's it's a it's a ho dunk town. It's small. Like yeah. it's a it's a tiny place. It's not super big. It, it's and, a snobby uh, farm town. It's it, 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 really yeah. definitely town. definitely places of it are for sure. And so yeah, it's just you're you're going into this big city, you know, life in the big city. You know, it's the classic story. You go to college and you're in the big city, and oh my oh my gosh, there's all <laughs> these cultures. It's a melting pot. You're overwhelmed. But no, I mean, in terms of it being an art school too, um, it was overwhelming because a lot of my knowledge of how to apply art was all like fine art. So like all physical, all like, you know, painting or charcoal or pencil. And, and how do I, you know, what do I do? I know portrait, I know landscape, I know still life, but how does that apply to a job? And so when you actually got to art school and you saw like the curriculums of like, oh, you could go down this path, you could be a board artist, or you could be like in the fashion industry, or you could do like graphic design, or, you know, all of a sudden it like branches all of these things. And so when I get there, my my, my uh, freshman year, it was kind of like, granted, they, they, they ease you in. So it's like that you take all general courses. So typical, you know, English history, stuff like that, but then like general art stuff. So you're going into like, you know, heads and hands or uh, life, life drawing, um, sculpture sometimes that may be a little later, I might be misremembering, but um, <laughs> so you're just kind of doing general application art um, yeah. to kind of like see, they're kind of testing you to see where you're at. So the first semester I was kind of like, all right, I'm just going to prove that I can do the basics. And then after that, it was overwhelming because it was like oh now there's like branching options you know and that's that was really overwhelming so what what did you end up what did you try any different kind of majors any different kind of classes you know put your foot in like the pool of water be like oop too cold too hot too muddy yeah and, and they kind of I, I tried to find so when i did my first few semesters i was really trying to like kind of do that dip my toe in places um, you know, I did stop motion for a little bit. I did 2D animation for a little bit. And um, while I don't think I did bad, I don't think I did great <laughs> either. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, and so uh, I was dipping my toe in a bunch of places. And I, I think ultimately uh, when I decided what I wanted to do, I, I did it more so out of, you know, thinking about it as like a good training for the future mm -hmm. so when i when i went and I, I so when i finally decided right all these branching paths um i decided to do 3d animation and uh because i did the three little bit of 3d i took in my courses i i really enjoyed and there was something about it that was different um than what i'd ever done before and so i thought this could be cool i feel like i was the most applicable or I was the most applicable in these places, and 3D seems to be where animation is going. Um, so that's where I went. I went to the 3D animation route. Yeah, because I'm trying to think, like 2010. Uh, what would have? Because that, that's about the time that you would have started going to school, right? Like yeah, 11, 12, if I remember vaguely correctly. It's all a blur, but yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. All right. So this is around the time that Pixar is becoming the big. big dick on campus it's every mm -hmm. you know it's the creme de la creme of animation yeah. you've got a lot of others kind of trying to integrate bits and pieces you have a legend of the guard the owls of gahul coming out and <laughs> blowing a lot yeah. of people's socks off so yeah i can totally see why you went into that at this time did you have any either at your maybe even your middle school at the community college or at your art school was there any good piece of advice that you received that helped shape you and point you in like, I don't want to say the right direction as if there's a wrong one, but the direction that you ended up taking? Interesting. No, I, I don't know if there's there was anything in school that really directed me to 3D animation. I think I just kind of jumped in like on a like just to see oh what no happen. sorry sorry, sorry not to, not to go to 3d animation but just bits of advice you got from because a lot of people that go into different art fields kind of figure their own shit out especially when it comes to like music that mm. there's a lot of you know kind of do it your way you know mileage may vary yada 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 but you went to and did so much traditional school with teachers got professionally trained got degrees in this i'm wondering if not you know on like oh you want your brush strokes to go down and then across but like 
some like kind of life or you know good heuristics for other artists that have really helped you along the way i don't you know i i, I don't know if that's happened that that didn't happen at the time i want to say when i was in college i feel like that's just been accumulated over like you know my my experience with it but like an early artist that that kind of influenced you know that i liked that i i want i drew a lot of inspiration from you know when i did my physical drawings mm -hmm. was a uh, caravaggio um i loved i loved his um his compositions and his use of color and like his kind of work would kind of steered my influence of of the art that i liked and um just how i kind of wanted to you know how i wanted to portray my art a lot of my like physical stuff is very much motivated by Caravaggio in terms of shadow and as to say just a shit ton of shadows. <laughs> yeah, shit ton of shadows and uh just the use of lighting. It's very dramatic, it's very contrast. Yeah. High contrast. Um and so I would say him. As I as I've gotten older, I seem to to be gravitating more towards like an abstract y night nightmarish kind of creepy like vibes um i, I can't remember so their caravaggio names. yeah yeah caravaggio <laughs> still kind of you know, up upgraded upgraded caravaggio oh, that's history nerd told me. caravaggio after dark after dark oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just a black it's just a black sheet. <laughs> there's nothing else it's just darkness it's so funny um <laughs> I, you so, know, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head, but there's, no, there's no. a few others. So it, it's really great that you brought up Caravaggio, because in this field, while some do and some don't, there is the opportunity to, you know, collab with somebody or work in a space with somebody or maybe even work under somebody. In this field of yours, whether it's, you know, doing 3D art, doing more traditional, like a painting or drawing whatever format you'd like is there anybody who you'd like to collab with or work with in any capacity Ooh, like my like my dream if i could work with anyone it could be a director it could capacity. be a creator it could be you know a, a fellow artist who you'd love to you know go have these on a piece of, for lack of a better term <laughs> <laughs> do you want to go have these you know painting with me it may sound cheesy, but like uh, I, I and honest and you know they're gonna if they hear this they'll kill me. But I would love to I would love to work on a project uh, with my friends again. Uh, we we started one in college that we we really got excited for. We spent m like maybe half a year developing characters for, and then we kind of fell off because you know we're young and we're in yeah. college, and you get you get the other things come up. But now it's like now that I'm older and more experienced, like I would love to work um, with my close friends here in LA on a project. And granted, I say that now, and like if they hear this, like, well, let's do something, and then I'll and I'll be like, all right, we'll do something, and then the year will go by, and we won't do it. Yeah, of course. But uh, I would love to work with them because I, I just love, I really respect them as artists. I love what they do, and um, it's fucking awesome. They just I don't know, like they have the same. I feel like they have a lot of the same. Uh, artistic like uh, leanings that I do in terms of like what kind of stories they want to tell yeah. and um, the kind of artwork they want to produce. And I feel like we kind of would blend fairly well. So this is from your time in San Francisco? Yeah, from San Francisco and also now because um, they're still, you know, they're still around here, thankfully. Yeah. And, uh, so how many yeah. of your friends that you went to uh, university with ended up down here in Los Angeles as working as artists? uh five wow yes that feels pretty uncommon is that or is that more common than i would think oh you know that's a good question i honestly don't know um it might be uncommon uh but i i think i think just hanging around with i think unfor hitters. the unfortunate reality <laughs> is is la has really unless you're going to another hub like you know in canada like toronto or something i feel like you're you're not really there's just not much else for artists outside of la in terms of if you want to get into the industry right yeah like and so a lot of it draws people a lot of artists who just want to just 
draw or they want to get in the industry they want to work on a show or do something like yeah i mean that makes sense yeah yeah so what would be all right well, well let's get to the occupations that you've gone through and where you are i guess i'm kind of jumping sure. the putting the cart before the horse a little bit no worries. so you come down here after finish i i'm assuming i I did finish. I did finish. <laughs> you, you finish. You finish uni. How quickly did you make it down to Los Angeles? It took me. Ooh, that's a good question. I want to say it took me about a year, if I remember correctly. So it didn't take me super long, surprisingly, because no, that, usually it takes quick, yeah. a lot longer. I um, I had done a internship over the summer the uh after the after i i graduated in that spring um got went back home and started applying and i got an intern a summer internship uh did that that was that was kind of interesting that was a lot of fun uh i i actually got to do 3d animation work because the 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 sad uh, to 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 quickly go to the the sad realization i barely i have not used my 3d animation uh, degree in like 10 years. <laughs> um, but I did when I got out of college and I, I did the summer internship at a company called uh, risk and strategic management. And uh, I got to animate weird meeply cute characters holding like <laughs> ass assault rifles and, and rocket launchers. And, uh, so it your was... childhood self was like, exactly. It was, was He's coming like, we back fucking out. Did it. I knew we... it. I yeah. knew we were going to get here. <laughs> exactly. I finally get to 3D animate the draw the characters I would always draw. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was so bizarre because I it was it was kind of that was re revelatory for me in terms of where how else I could apply 3D animation because I'd never so what the company does is they essentially create safety protocols and videos for clients and their clients are predominantly like oil companies and like shipping companies so like you would have to deal with like pirate threats if you were like on a shipping boat. And so they would create <laughs> these safety videos about how to survive a pirate attack. And so I got to animate. Just take out a bazooka and you aim you it at the raft. <laughs> <laughs> right? Problem if only. solved. <laughs> no, yeah, right. But like, so yeah, so that, that was my summer internship was animating weird meeple characters for these safety videos. And so after that, I did have a, problem committing after that like i was like oh no, job application's going bad or whatever <laughs> and my, my parents kind of sit down with me because i was just playing that was the year destiny came out and that got really bad i got i got sucked into that like, what's the year <laughs> destiny came out and i think a friend had just bought it and so we were just playing it just incessantly play the hell for, out of it for months and my parents had to sit me down and be like kyle you need to you need to apply yourself and i'm like you're right so i finally <laughs> did valid <laughs> valid validation but uh but yeah and my, my dad had uh known and so i made it down to la about after a year um i got an interview at a company called renegade animation i flew down there in a suit and i <laughs> I, I i got i went to the interview and they were really impressed that i wore a suit and i yeah. just thought that that was i just thought my that was favorite, the norm. It's my favorite thing about la too is that you like come in, <laughs> in a suit and a tie they're like holy fucking shit this, yeah, this guy means business and you're just like yeah. isn't this the way they're like no yeah we're surprised you're not wearing flip flops yeah right well definitely in the animation industry because you go the, you go any studio and pretty much only the uh like higher up business people are wearing anything semi collar yeah. related everyone else is just <laughs> in like casual wear yeah um and yeah here here is me with this you know wedding suit that i <laughs> that i've only worn at weddings for this tux <laughs> this tuxedo so wedding suit but uh yeah, so I, I just had I got an interview and I got the job and then I, I made the move down, which was exciting and scary all over again. So. <laughs> so you do that, you're moving down here. You've been working in the biz. What what has your been your pro as blah, blah. Mm -hmm. what projects have your been your pro your predominant focus like have you been doing animation predominantly it sounds like you haven't been doing 3d animation prop predominantly like what where has a lot of your focus been when it comes to output um i mean at this i mean at this time and and now predominantly 
Uh, unfortunately, it's it's maybe not unfortunately. I, I'm I'm very thankful to have gotten the opportunities I have, but uh, I've been predominantly doing uh, coordination work. So it's you know when you're on a project on a production, the coordinator is kind of the glorified middleman. They are the information broker, right? They've got to they've got to give everyone the information they need to do the the project that they need that needs to get done, and so they work with the schedule and they make sure that everyone is on board. And so I was, I was predominantly doing that. I was intern, I was interning as a, uh, I just started as an intern at Renegade, got up to coordinator after a month. They liked my, my work ethic. And then, um, yeah, I got up to product, uh, production. It was storyboard coordinator actually. So uh, what, what goes into being a storyboard coordinator? Cause that sounds for those outside the, the industry, that kind of sounds like a made up term. Like oh, yeah, absolutely. I coordinate storyboards. Like you yeah. just said four discordant words. Like I don't know what you're talking about. Predominantly, what we do is we work with our board artists, and we're managing the schedule, and we're making sure that they're given the time and the assets they need to actually board out the episodes. And so, if you don't know, in cartoons, it's your pre-production phase. You have your storyboards and those are just rough drawings of the characters that they're creating from the script and they're given a certain amount of time to completely draw the entire script and then pitch it and so your job as a coordinator is to make sure that if they need a design like they're like oh this part of the episode um this character is interacting in the kitchen with a blender you need then they're like but we don't we don't know what that looks like then you need to provide them with the assets so that they can know what they're drawing and so that they can accurately make the episode happen and so you're predominantly doing that you're just you're kind of a support person for your board crew and you're just making sure that you're you you give them everything they need so that they can get stuff done on time and also you're making sure that they they, they can get it done in time because sometimes you know you have artists who work at different rates and different speeds and sometimes they'll need a little more time for certain sections than others and so you just gotta you know juggle and plan accordingly and give them more time when they need it and maybe you flip episodes around so that a board artist who finishes sooner you review that one first and then you allow that other artist more time to finish theirs. so it's a lot of that kind of stuff a lot of back and forth schedule management with uh, your artists so it kind of sounds like and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it almost sounds like you're kind of brokering a peace agreement between production and the artists of like the, of. the production's like, all right, three days until yeah. like, to, to product. You're like, the artists are like nine years. You're like, all right, how about two months? And like, yeah. the artists are like, no. mm, okay. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. You're definitely, yes, you're definitely trying to be the, the, uh, the, the mediator where you're you're trying to figure out what's best for best for all parties and um and just working in that middle that gray area absolutely so let me know if this is too touchy a subject but does it bother you to be working around artists but not be contributing in the artistic sense that you kind of grew up wanting to do and were trained to do I think on some level, yes, absolutely. There's a part of me that always is itching to like lend a hand to add my creative element to it. Um, I would say partly more so on the design uh, side of things than on on the boarding. Um, I think the you know the the reality is is I, I know what kind of an artist I am, and I'm an incredibly slow artist. I'm just very mm. litigious and I'm very critical, and I think a lot of artists struggle with um getting over just putting a line down on the page and not immediately regretting it <laughs> and yeah. erasing it um and when you're a board artist you really you really can't you've got to work fast you've got to work rough and you've got to be okay with that and uh and you've got to be very loosey-goosey and uh, I, that's just i i realized early on that i am just not that kind of artist i am yeah i am very i would be very um i would hoard if I was a board artist, I would hoard my boards and I would not allow anyone to view them until I knew that they They're were perfect. They're not done yet. <laughs> They're not done yet. Don't touch them. And you just, you can't do that. You can't do that in a, in a professional setting. It's just not, not feasible, not realistic. So I, I definitely think I would love to, 
eventually get into potentially doing some design work or even just doing my own stuff. But in terms of applying my art skills to the industry, I, I've I've kind of come to realize that I would either really need to train myself up significantly to to meet that 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 standard, or I would just need to go off and work on my own stuff on my own time. Yeah. So in many lines of work, there are kind of secret terms or just things that the t public doesn't get to know about kind of not necessarily like, you know, somebody has been paid hush money, but you know, it just doesn't come <laughs> up in popular light. Are there any of those kind of like fun little doodads or lexicons that you can share with us? Sure. I mean, there's a few, there, there's a bunch of boring ones, obviously, but some of the, the more, the, the more, the more fun ones, uh, you know, a simpler one is you. So this is one that that kind of annoys me, but is still kind of funny, um, because I was brought up to say it one way. So when you're in an edit session or you're working with the boards or you're you're watching down an episode, whatever stage it's at, mm -hmm. there's always a term you learn about talking about the the start of a scene and an end of a scene, and a scene is just you know what what it is. It's the beginning and end of motion in this one frame yeah and then when you cut that's a separate scene but in when i was starting out you learn heads and tails so the start of a of a scene is heads and the end of a frame of a scene is tails and then when i got onto another studio i started hearing people calling it breakfast and dinner and so when people are in an edit bay and like oh i want that line uh make that line come in more breakfast or hey Hang on, that that sound effect. Uh, push that dinner, and it's just like, <laughs> and in, and and it's kind of weird in a scene where you're shoot like when you're making a thing about like food, though, right? Oh yeah, I, that that would be that'd be amazing. Like you're yeah, you're working on a food based episode, and it's like I want that cake more breakfast. I want that cake. Move that cake more dinner. Like uh, I want that eating sound more dinner. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh can get a little interesting. I'm sure a little confusing. But another one that I, I can't unfortunately name specifics, but I will just give a shout out to all of the uh, the sound designers and editors of the world because I love their lexicons for how they they use the onomatopoeia for a lot of like trying to figure uh -oh. out what kind of sound to use. Yeah. And, and they're like- A little bit more like- <laughs> Yeah, like, <laughs> you, you say that as a joke, but I, I sit in rooms with these guys- There's like and when artists in, 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 so in the, just... <laughs> in, Oh, they're artists of their craft and you are sitting in a mix and they're like, Hey uh, Brian, I I need. Can you get me the flap with the guan at the end of it? <laughs> and they're like, Oh yeah, I got you. I found three of those in 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 the live in in this folder. I'll, I'll send them your way. Or like, I need. I really I need... hope they are listed with those onomatopoeias as the titles. Of it's like, pretty close. <laughs> I was given. I was given a. Uh, I I was trying to find it for this uh, for this interview, and I could not find it. But I was given a document, a PDF that had like the breakdown of how they they categorized or at least the, the company Fuck that yeah, i work with awesome. how they categorize their sounds and it's just amazing I, I would laugh out loud it's so great and the fact that they know this by like memory is yeah. even more so just hilarious to me where it's like i need the ka-chunk with the guy and they're like <laughs> oh yeah i know where that is i'll go find it for you and it's just like man those guys they operate on a separate level a different wavelength that's just incredible to me random coincidence i was watching some like youtube video where you're watching a rapper with his uh, sound technicians build a beat from scratch. And he's just playing the beat and goes, yeah, yeah, just a little bit like, you know, doo -doo, doo -doo. he's like, all right, I speed it up and add a little like uh, to it. And like, and like, and they're doing it and like, it's not real time. It's like, you know, truncated and cut together, but it's all just like, it, it's very clearly the same day. And there's like building it from scratch and they're all just kind of like jamming on it. It's so beautiful and lovely. Just like I'm imagining the same thing with like, yeah, yeah, get a little crush, crush. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so, you know it when you're in sound, right? That's uh, exactly your craft. I I hope and imagine that those that especially Foley artists, but just sound people in general, walk around with just a high res recorder in their pocket, just waiting for a noise so they can like turn, like record out like a a ghost spotter or something like that. I don't know. Oh, I be I would not put it past them. I would absolutely believe that. It's incredible so, that they can throw together. Yeah. In movies and TV, they often showcase things that are also in movies and TV. Are there any times, especially with something so behind the scenes, that they get wrong or any ones that are very um 
on top of things that showcasing what is truly going on for you in your life, either as an artist or as somebody who is, you know, keeping the peace between the production and the artists? I don't know. So you're asking if there's like been a movie about like coordinators? It doesn't need <laughs> and to be if, a and movie. And if, if it's been like represented correctly. It doesn't need to be a movie uh, solely about coordinators, but scenes that showcase coordinators in a way that you believe is actually accurate. Or if they're, or even artists, as you have so much interaction with them and are one yourself that you feel like, no, that was a pretty good job. Even, you know, one of the ones that's always kind of done up and understandably so because it's comedically hilarious, but like when they do art school or an art college in a movie, it's fucking nuts. <laughs> are there any that you feel like were just way off the mark or were actually surprisingly on point in, mm. in either your occupation or in your education? Interesting, you're challenging my movie knowledge here. Um, yeah, it's I'm trying to uh, see what actually is trying to happen is I'm trying to take your job by showcasing how little you know of movies. Yeah, right. So that... Exactly. <laughs> oh man, if we were in a different catalog. I'd have you beat. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, it's those. That's a really good question. Um, it's hard. I I know that there's been movies that can represent certain aspects of what I've seen well, but it's not like the whole movie. Sure. Usually it'll be like a snippet here or like a Oh, if there's any snippets, there. if, if you can highlight a snippet, I am here for it. Um, oh my goodness. Or Turn even if blanks. the movie isn't coming to mind and you can think of the way it's usually portrayed versus the way it is, I'm, I, that would be any and all insight. I, welcome. No, I, I understand. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wish I had more than my initial thought here. Um, I mean, I, if you've ever seen Mrs. Doubtfire, that opening sequence where Robin Williams is literally doing ADR to the, the little animated characters. Yeah. Um, is very accurate to actual ADR in terms of like, you know, those those artists having to like sit down and actually have to try and time their lips to what's been animated and like, if they want to make creative changes, they really can't because it's like at that point we've already animated it. So it's kind of a big deal if you want to like change stuff at that point. Oh, I thought it was done the other way around. I it can it was... be. Oh, it can okay. be. Um, I, that scene in particular, because of that situation, it was probably ADR. They probably, uh, in my brain, they probably had fired the original <laughs> voice talent for yeah. that or he died or who whatever. Yeah. And they had to bring in Robin Williams to fill in the, the gap. And so he got Which, hired on. Can you afterwards. imagine a worse person to bring in to fill in the gap for something that's already been animated <laughs> than somebody who has never read or followed a script a day in their life? Right, right. It's someone who just wants to be creative all the time. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that that's that's like pretty accurate in terms of of that but um i mean honestly there's documentaries out there that are really good um you know to showcase the behind the scenes i always tout the lord of the rings extended edition release documentaries of the making ofs watch mm -hmm. that that's a great look into like how things are done and and that has some great behind the scenes of like production people pulling out their hair um oh yeah that poor, that you, you would see peter jackson yeah on that fuck jesus christ yeah. So but, I just uh, found out not not to take the mic. No, 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 fine. I just found out the other day that Vigo Mortensen flew in the first day he was to shoot the scene, and that's because he'd just been hired because they just canned the other dipshit whose name I don't remember or care to find out because they weren't willing to do any practice. Like they weren't oh, willing that to the like, reason. Yeah, they that's weren't funny. willing to like run the scenes or anything like that. Like mm -hmm. or, you know any of the sword fighting stuff he's like whatever it'll be fine and peter jackson's like no you have to do the thing and he's like nah it's okay They're like fuck this guy get him out of here and they just like vigo was not number one draft pick he was you know called in they're like yeah we can get this guy and then vigo was just all about it did everything and then if wasn't on if he wasn't on set being aragorn he was fly fishing which just fucking amazing like that kind of feels like a strider move Oh, I don't need be needed. I'm going to go catch some fish in the most absurdly improper way possible. That takes way too much effort. That he tracks. Se yeah, he seems like a very he seems like an old soul. He seems like a man who's like from a different Fact. time. Oh, no, he totally, totally yeah. is. There's uh, what 
there's this i don't know how i think that was on a flight i remember reading an interview that somebody got to do with vigo where they like flew to upstate new york met he picked them up at the airport he picked up the interviewer and this is like after he's done movies like he's a known quantity he drives up in a car picks up the interviewer and then takes them on the, like a trip and oh, he's just like cool. smoking cigarettes and just like hanging out <laughs> goes to a bar where people kind of know him but not as an actor just some guy right. who's there he's just like this salt of the earth guy who's just like kind of he's like likes to act but the idea of fame is just like lost on him he's like ah, i just don't care <laughs> like he's I totally, it, it, I can totally believe accurate. that. I can yeah. totally believe that, just by the projects he chooses to be. But yeah, no, it's. Uh, but yeah, so I, there's no like one place I can point to. I, I would say like I, I because really like Hollywood hasn't really depicted, from what I can tell, you know, stuff that I've I've gone through very accurately. Besides, I know there's one. I, there, there's one that I can't put a name of that I still need to watch, but I don't even know if it, if it's that accurate because I haven't seen it yet. So it's uh it's it's tough it, it, and what we do is it's like it's the very unromantic side yeah. of hollywood right where we're we're like we're not doing the art we're not like the big decision makers we're just making sure that the decisions getting made are getting done and getting done on time and in budget and <laughs> and sometimes like with my, my my current job we have to be the guys to tell you well we can't really do this so how do you want to not do this but still get what you want <laughs> <laughs> it's like crossbreeding an accountant with a sheep herder. Ooh, <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> it's all yours. It's all yours. So, whether it be art or whether it be you know you brokering this deal between these two houses, what would you say is the biggest misconception about your passion by the wider world? Ooh, I don't know if the wider world knows about it enough to be a misconception um <laughs> I, I guess maybe what when you talk about your occupation when somebody asks and you actually have the time to break it down for them what are they oh. like oh really or like oh this and you're just like no not not that at all oh well about coordination work i mean i think the biggest miss oh what's a big misconception uh i i think that they think that we're i don't know like I just don't think people know that we exist. Um, <laughs> I really don't think people know that coordinators are a thing sometimes. Like they're like, oh, I mean, I think that maybe subconsciously people do know that like, oh yeah, it makes sense. You need an in-between person to, yeah. to communicate information. But like, I do feel like a lot of times when I tell people what I do, they're like, like they get the confused face <laughs> of like, what is that? What, what, why, how, when, you know, like they just, I, I don't think a lot of people understand that there are coordination coordinators in in the workforce um yeah i don't I, that's a good that's i don't know i don't know man so <laughs> i i guess may, maybe then as you do work around artists and you are a trained artist yourself is there something that when you talk about working with artists that they are just like kind of the ideas they throw out the notions of like oh this is how animation works right and you're just like god damn muggles <laughs> I think a lot of uh, misconceptions comes from like, um, especially now being in it and I, and I can talk to a lot of, and I've taught, I've spoken to some younger artists. There is this kind of misconception about like ideas and where it feels like they're, you know, they're super hungry and they want to work. And I think that's great. And a lot of them will come to like, they'll have like ideas where it's like, Oh, it's like this and that mixed together. And sometimes that can work, but I, I think ultimately it's like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Uh, <laughs> the reality is that you don't get to be this like free spirit that, you know, paints the universe. It's more like, yeah, here's it, a box, color it the color yeah, we want yeah, to. That's, with the different that's a good way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for directing me. That's a that's perfect <laughs> example because like, that is true. It's like, I, I think a lot of people like, they're like, I'm going to go and do and create the thing. And yes you can to a certain degree but there's it's it's a team it's it's for first and foremost it is a team project like yeah it, it may be your baby but now it's ev everyone who has to help bring it to life you know now you have hundreds of people who are trying to make this a reality but there's also the reality of it where it's like you have all these people and you know the decisions you make to create this thing you know affects a lot of people and so you have to make sure 
and that's a lot of stress. And it's like, you have to make sure that the decisions you're making aren't going to hurt a lot of people around you. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, there's, there are creatives who they have a vision and they want to get it done and they understand how to get it done. They want to get it done, but maybe they don't necessarily care or understand what those decisions will entail for the, 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 the crew currently on a project. And so that, that can be frustrating, but I, I would say like people like who want to get into it and want to create, don't let that deter you. Just, just understand that it is a team. It is a, it is a team project. It is a team building exercise. And, to just everyone's there to want to help you and to just be understanding and caring that, you know, we might need to have some concessions here and there for certain things. Yeah, you're, the way you're talking about this really reminds me, uh, there was an interview with Dana Gould ages ago, a uh, comedian and then writer on The Simpsons, talking about writing as if people come in on this idea that you're like building this, you know, perfect piece of art, this boat that cannot be touched lest you like, diminish its glory he's like you're a draftsman you're going to put forth this thing and people are going to go that shit we like about a third of it maybe try again keep mm -hmm. that third lose the rest or you know add this color of hair change the color nose he walks that way instead of this way try yeah. again and th this idea of preciousness and this you know like they yeah. can't hurt my baby I, I will never befoul my vision to meet these corporate overlords. yeah you fucking will you want to have a fucking job so uh, get with the plan and, you know, it's, it's a nose on boys. Yeah. It's a push me, pull you situation. And, 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 you know, there, there's always a battle cause we're all artists here, right? We're all in the industry. We're all here because we're drawn to, you know, art in some <laughs> form or another. Right. And, and, and we all want it to be great. We, because we yeah. all are affected by the art we consume, you know, to some degree, you know, it helps shape us in to some way. And, and for me as well. And, I think I think we look at art as this cultural thing and it affects everyone and and we are our culture and and I think we all take it upon ourselves to make it important because it is to to a degree Absolutely. and uh, and so there is always this battle where are we making we want to make this thing culturally relevant we want to make it impactful but then there's the reality of well we have this much much money and we have this much time so yeah. you know we have to like scale expectations we can still make what we want to make, but maybe it won't be the perfect, as you're saying, the precious thing that we want it to be. Yeah. It kind of has to be potentially a whittled down version or just different. Um, and that is always disappointing. But, you know, we, as I said, we're all in it together and we all want to make it, hopefully make it a thing. And, you know, we just have to try and do our best. So on the flip side of this, either talking about art as a general whole or, you know, art coordination hmm. what is your favorite non-obvious aspect that people just don't know even exists that they couldn't even get wrong if they tried because it's such an unknown fact to them that is just so lovely so beautiful and so precious to you about about the the job um about either either art as a general like you know kind of drawing in the perspective of being an artist or the coordination thereof um, for me, for drawing, it's just a wonderful puzzle. I love, and that's why I find it so meditative. And maybe not a lot of people who are, hmm. are who aren't artists don't know. But for me, drawing is this really fun, you know, thing to figure out because it it's all about laying lines down. Like you, you kind of maybe you go into it with an idea, maybe you go in there with no idea, but you go down to lay down lines and the way you lay them down and how you lay them down becomes like a dance where you're just trying to figure out what line will work best for this overlap. Like I have this forearm coming forward with my hand. What is the, you know, how can I show a line to overlap the, 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 the palm of the hand over the forearm to show the, the foreshortening to make this more effective. And to me, that's what I love. And that, that, you know, as much as there is a frustrating nature of like, I, I, I always have trouble getting started, but if I can get started, there's this wonderful, like problem solving of trying yeah. to get the lines to communicate what I want communicated. 
what I want people to see. And that to me is, is like kind of the magic that I don't think a lot of people know about artwork and, and creating artwork is that, that creative process of discovering what the piece is while you're making it. And like the, the little things that like, while you're laying down the lines, like, Oh, it did this, like, that's cool. Let's chase that direction um, of it. And, and just like embracing, embracing that for me is just great. But. Well, to go, to go from great to the god darn it, Kyle, my friend, what is your preposterous peeve? Uh, okay. I am incredibly frustrated by being stuck behind a car who always has to slow down when they turn. And this could be a turn that they have the right of way. It's green. It's open. There's no one blocking their path. There's no pedestrians. And yet they still have to slow down to like two miles an hour and to make the turn and to slowly turn around that corner to me is like the most annoying thing that I ever have to deal with. <laughs> and it just rubs <laughs> me the wrong way every single time. <laughs> I hate slow turners. There's, I, I just, I can't, I can't deal with it. You know where you're going. Why do you have to slow down so much? <laughs> What if they have a dinosaur egg in their car? They need to save have... the T-Rex race. Ah. Is this something that bothered you from before you even moved to the big shitty in That's... San Francisco? Or was that, has this always been an issue for you? That's fair. I, you know, I, it's a very good question. Uh, I, I cannot recall. I, I want to say that it probably came about since moving to LA. Um, <laughs> just because car culture is stupid here and it's huge. Um but it's probably then. It's probably when I moved to LA. I, I I don't think this has been with me forever because um San Francisco wasn't too bad. Yeah. Not not like I mean here. you don't know, on the plus side, San Francisco is so One way one, one ways was the problem. Sorry, what? <laughs> well, it's just kind of nice in, in San Francisco. It's like yeah, it, it sucks, but also you don't have that far to go. It's like the traffic's bad. It's also yeah. usually the traffic is just so damn slow that it doesn't matter. Like you're not moving that fast. LA, it's yeah. like there's so far and it's so slow that when somebody's going slow and you like they could be going at normal speed, it just feels like horse shit. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, so that that's that's for me. That that's mine. Like and yeah, it's probably a later in life thing because I have to drive <laughs> all the time everywhere. But yeah, it's just I can't stand it. When did you or not when? Well, I guess when, uh, when did you have a time where this really showcased itself as being problematic? Like where the, uh, you know, it was the biggest offender, if you will. Ooh, um, like there was a moment where I realized. Yeah. What, what's your hall of fame, uh, <laughs> explosion? My hall of fame explosion. Yeah. Oh God. Um, uh, there wasn't like a specific one. It just kind of built up over time, but it's just like one of those things where, where you just get heated and I must've just been having a bad day, but I just, I just remember just shouting like <laughs> stupidly loud and you're, you're in your car and there's no one else around. So it's silly. And you're just like getting <laughs> so mad. And it was just cause I was in a hurry, obviously, cause you're always in a hurry and they just had to be that one person to be the barrier, right? Like the classic, you're rushing home. Yeah. And, you, and oh, because of that, everything becomes an obstacle and a barrier. And it just becomes that one person who just can't, you know, go fast enough because <laughs> you have to get somewhere. And I just, I just started like just losing my shit and just shouting so loud. And uh, like when you do, when you're like getting way too in much into video games and you just start yelling at the screen <laughs> randomly and your parents are like, what are you mad at? And like, I'm sorry, it's just a game. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's this 13 year old um, kid. He won't stop a, killing me. Exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> kind of, it's like channeling that energy. Uh, whenever, when I, whenever I would drive and just come across that and it's like, Oh God, well, gone taken too far. In, <laughs> got too far in a few places. All right. Well, lastly, before we throw it to our commercial break, if you could have the listeners of this podcast, your one song of your choosing, which would it be? Uh, this was hard. Uh, I, I, I juggled, I juggled and I, and I, uh, 
I had restless nights over this, but uh, I, I will have to recommend uh, a King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizards song, The Dripping Tap, uh, just because I want more people to know about them. I'm sure they're pretty popular, but I, I don't know of a lot of people who, who know of them. So I have to recommend them because they're just an awesome band, and I've really grown to love them over the last like three years or so. And they just do everything, and they're super fun and zany. And the Dripping Tap, I think, is a great intro because it's just a long ass rock epic song that just doesn't stop, and it's fun. If people like good rock. I think they'll like King Gizzard and Lizard Wood. All right, and with that, we're going to throw it to our sponsors, so Kyle can have a minute or two to put on this year rubber suit before we get all up in the lightning round. But if advertisements aren't your thing, why not have a listen to the Dripping Tap? by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Or if you really want to hear a song from a previous episode, please check out the playlist on Spotify, Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves podcast, Song Rex. It's a long title, I know. Don't worry, there's a link in the description. Either way, see you in a bit. Hey you. Yes, you. Yes, I'm, I'm talking to you. Have you ever wanted to record audio? Or perhaps fiddle with recorded audio? Maybe even record audio of a fiddle and then fiddle with said audio. Well, now you can with Aw, Da, City? With all the run of the mill bells and whistles, you'll be confusing yourself with the tech in no time. But won't that cost lots of money? Because with my snow blowing habit, I can only afford it. It ain't gonna cost shit. Aw, Da, City? Is free and easy enough to use that even a snow blowing son of a gun can use it too. And we're back. Kyle, are you ready to enter? Let's do it. All right, buckle your seatbelts and keep your arms inside the ride at all times. Is karma real? Yes. Are hot dogs tacos? <laughs> No. <laughs> Do people who prefer Pepsi to Coke deserve human rights? Oh. Sure, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Is peeing in the shower normal human behavior or just for those filthy mer people? First one. <laughs> Would you rather have tentacle arms or kangaroo legs? Tentacle arms. Make the food or do the dishes? Make the food. <laughs> Did you ever cheat on a test in school? Absolutely. Have you ever had a crush on a cartoon character? Absolutely. <laughs> Which is realer, mermaids or Bigfoot? Ooh. Mermaids. Would you rather have a teleporter or a time machine? Uh, teleporter <laughs> are you out of touch or is it the children who are wrong <laughs> no it is the children who are wrong <laughs> do you create your own thoughts or do you just listen to them listening to them is fun album shuffle or playlist playlist is there such a thing as a perfect piece of art no, it's impossible. Is professional wrestling cool or lame? Cool as fuck. You're having the best day of your life. What happens next? Another amazing thing or something terrible? Another amazing thing. Why not? I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you eat 37 of your favorite food for $5,000 in a one hour time limit? No way. If you want me to get me to hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, congratulations. You've survived the lightning round. Now, before we move on, I, like many listeners at home, would like to now know, what is your favorite food that you couldn't eat 37 of in a one-hour time limit for $5,000? Ooh, it's my favorite food that I couldn't eat. Uh, well, I... I yeah. So, I mean, one of my favorite things, I don't know if this is an official term, but my mom makes these things called picnic logs and they're just these really lovely, just wrapped, uh, 
sausage rolls that I just can't get enough of. Um, <laughs> well, I, apparently I can because I wouldn't eat 37 of them <laughs> for $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough screwing around. Now is my reward, the gallivant guest ye. I grant thee a lightning round question of your own to be echoed until we get bored of it. What you got? One good novel or a 12 book series? I can't read for shit. One good novel. <laughs> I know my brother is screaming 12 book series, but I, I am a one good novel. I do. I've, I, I've I, come around because it's like, I would, I would have told you 12 book series like a couple of years ago, but now with like my time, it's kind of like, do I want the 80 hour RPG or do you want the eight hour artsy game? It's like, I'll take the eight hour artsy yeah. game any any old day and it's the same idea there where it's like i'll take the yeah. one good novel times like one this of the things like i one and done yeah one of the things that i mean i think i say it on basically every single one of these podcasts is i appreciate everybody spending their time because time is just so precious and like living in la traveling to work trying to you know do a project time is so important mm -hmm. that like i while i do love some of these old great ones i did as a kid or, you know, some of them do have, you know, I've heard The Wheel of Time is a busted series and a must read. Or One Piece is an amazing manga and anime. It's like, yeah, they're also longer than I'll be alive. So I'm not going to get to them. I'm sorry. That being said, I read Berserk growing up. So, yeah, of course, I recommend it to everybody, even though it's like 50 volumes and not done yet. So I, well, I get it, but also. It is, but it isn't. It's done in, it's done in my heart with the uh, unfortunate passing of the the author i agree although said uh, side tangent apparently his understudies are finishing it uh per his request and given his notes and apparently there's only like one or two more arcs left and then they're done so eh. wow. anyway enough nerd talk let's wrap Never. this sucker up Anything you want to plug, shouts you'd like to give, places people can find you or your content? Um, I don't have too much social media presence anywhere, as all my friends begrudgingly tell me. Uh, but <laughs> uh, if you want to find out anything about me, I have a LinkedIn. Uh, it has all my professional information on there if you're fascinated in that. But uh, for more fun stuff, I do recommend checking out my uh, Metal Odyssey playlist on Spotify. It is a, a curated playlist that I've been working on for seven plus years now. I have not said this yet in the podcast, but I'm a huge fan of metal music. Uh, I've been listening to it forever, and it's my favorite genre. And this playlist is 500 plus songs, all single songs from all every, you know, each uni unique band that I just love. So if you like metal music and if you want to listen to something that you're familiar with, maybe something you're not, I try to go for the unique. I highly recommend it. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks, Kyle, for being my guest today. And a special thanks to my editor, Richard Ashford, and my composer, Joshua Gibbons. And thank you. Yeah, you. Right there, you. Listening at home. Or, you know, wherever you find time to appreciate this. Time really is the most precious commodity we have. And I really appreciate you spending yours with us. And if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe, like, you know, share with a friend. Every little bit helps. Or if you already have and are out of episodes to listen to, don't worry. We put out a new episode every Monday at midnight or before on SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes at Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves Podcast. And a very special thanks are due to our patrons, Sabella Yellow. And if you'd like to join said illustrious ranks and if your name are allowed, just head on over to patreon.com backslash passionate people and preposterous peeves podcast. And do remember, folks, if days are numbered and songs are sung, at the end of the day, I think we've all won. So please stick around because great things have only just begun. <laughs>